Please be seated. So I think last year we spent some time with uh, those miraculous healings. Um, uh, but I don't think, uh, since we're reading Romans in Bible study uh, right now, that I'm going to be able to get away from Abraham uh, this morning. So that's, that's where we're going to stay. Um, as we have both accounts from, from Genesis and, and Paul's letter to Rome, uh, it seems that Abraham spans the Testaments. Not just as our ancestor in faith, but as, as a model of faithfulness. His story is not without its foibles, however. We know that story. Um, And if you think about it, neither are ours. But the Bible readings pair nicely today as the entire fourth chapter of Romans deals with this first bit that we get in Genesis harkens back to this moment of God's call to Abraham and his response, his trust in God before any sign of favor had become manifest. So Abraham trusted in God before anything was given to him, save for a promise. Yes? Okay, we can go on. Uh, For the next several weeks, we're going to be following um, Abraham's story, journeying, as it were, uh, through the stages until the story shifts uh, from Abraham to his offspring. This is what the church calls the tracks. Track one and track two, right? So we're going to be in track one for a while now. Track one means that we read these great swaths of scripture versus like a thematic reading. So when you keep coming to church and you're still in Genesis, like in November, (laughs) serious, not not November, um, more like next February, uh, (laughs) that's track one, okay? And so we're going to be reading through Genesis and some some very, very long passages in the Old Testament, which is kind of cool, because we don't really stick in there. We kind of go right for the gospel, because it's got a lot of good stuff, but so does the Old Testament. And so I think, it's, I think if we afford ourselves that opportunity, it's an epic that we know well. It's an epic that we, we should return to from time and time again because it holds the seeds of some of our theological understanding of the New Testament. Um, and so when it comes to Abraham, the father of many nations, the vista is, I think, wide enough for everyone to see something. And I suspect that you will not only see our story, in Abraham's story, but just how uh, wonderful it is that our lineage can be traced back to him. As we do that, we'll we'll find ourselves uh, side by side some of the other great Abrahamic faiths, that of Judaism, Islam, not to mention the, the fragmented world that is Christianity, yes? Okay, all right, we're working. All right. When I think of Abraham, I also think of thresholds. Abraham was just hanging out, and then God showed up. Kind of like Jesus just showed up in Peter's boat, but that's, that's, a, that's another thing. Um, God just showed up, and Abraham answered the call. He crossed over that threshold into new territory. And so I think we're conditioned to think of God's Uh, the primacy of God's righteousness in that call. But this was a really big thing, that an unknown God called an elderly family into relationship, and then they had to journey for miles and miles and miles until they came to the place that God directed them. And so... I've been really thinking about Abraham's trust in all of that and what it means to trust in our own lives. This goes beyond just confidence now, right? Trust is very different than, like, I have confidence in someone. Abraham trusted, almost recklessly trusted. And so when I think about Abraham's trust, I think that involves 
faith, right? I think that involves hope. And surely there was love, love creating the new relationship. So um, this story, the story of like this, this guy just trusting in this call holds within it the seeds of those great theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. And they do that right beside all of Abraham's oddities. They do that right beside all of our oddities. And so that makes both this story of Abraham and ours, both Genesis and Paul trying to figure out what he's figuring out in Romans, miraculously and marvelously human. It's our story. I also think about how Abraham never fully realized the promises that were made to him. Yes, he was a blessing. People blessed, people blessed him, God blessed them, right? People cursed him, God cursed them. Like there was that stuff going on. But he, the promise that he would be the father of many nations, like Abraham never really lived to see that. We are alive at a time when we can look back in the scriptures and see like, yes, he was the father of many nations, but Abraham never fully saw the promise in the flesh. And that's like us too, in what scholars have come to call the age of what we live in as the, pre- the, the moments of already, but not yet, right? It's a very technical theological term that it's already, but not yet. Sometimes I think they don't know what they're talking about. Sometimes I don't know what I'm talking about. But I do know that it is so much already and not yet that we have been given the same kind of promise, the very best promise of life everlasting, right? Through Jesus Christ. We've been given a promise by a God who has gone on ahead of us to prepare a place for us. And we must trust in that before we see it. In our Bible study this week, we explored the fourth chapter of Romans, um, returning to Paul's statement that now, that now there, is, there is no difference between Greek or Jew. The same Lord is the Lord of all. That's a, that is a powerful statement. Like we are all one in Christ, right? And while Paul is undoubtedly um, making that claim to this Christian church of Rome, he does so by invoking the ancient, his, ancient history of Israel. He's making that claim they were all one in Christ, but in doing so, he goes all the way back to Abraham. Pointing to the fact that Abraham was declared righteous before there was a law. And that's really important to us who are not Jews, right? He was declared righteous before the law. And we receive that same invitation through faith to be justified before the Lord, justified through Christ as Gentile believers. It's pretty big. Sometimes it can be a snoozer, but it's pretty big, right? This is serious for us. And as fantastic as that claim is, and I want to kind of stick there, but, you know, I see the the theological glaze just kind of going over your eyeballs right now. Um, There was a statement in Romans that really caught my eye uh, this, this week, and that is, what does it mean to hope beyond hope? What does it mean to hope against hope? Because Paul says that. Paul says that about Paul says that about Abraham. Theologians will tell us that hope is a power that is directed towards a future that is good but it might be hard to attain that. 
Not impossible, but there may be some difficulties in obtaining that future. Hope, therefore, is the elevation of the will, our will. And that elevation is made possible by grace, by love, by unmerited love. By which we as Christians expect many things. Like our prayers are full of hope. We ask God for quite a bit. But we also trust and hope for one very marvelous thing. And that is the fulfillment of God's promise that we will have life in Jesus. Hope, then, is one of the great theological virtues. And it comes, I want you to see this, it comes after faith. After faith, right? So there's faith, there's hope, and there's love. Okay? Abraham displayed great faith in his trust. He hoped against hope. Right? So we're moving in stages. Right? And hope is very akin to the, the power of desire. Like when we hope, we desire something. And so that's very close to love, right? It's perfected by love, if you want to think about it that way. Or as Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, now, faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these is love. Yeah, Glenn, Glenn's mouth in the back there. He knows that one. See, you're tracking. The extreme test of our hope, the extreme test of hope, is death. Death before one is able to produce an offspring, as it is in Abraham's case. But whereas the sins against hope are despair, and anticipated failure, right? And presumption as an anticipated fulfillment. Sort of like we do that, when we do that, we take the situation into our own hands and we don't allow God to sort of operate, allow God to be God. Let go and let God, that's a great one. Y'all have heard that one before, haven't you? Okay, let's bring that bumper sticker right in. Abraham doesn't do that. Instead, he trusts openly, almost like Job later on down the road, when Job tells his friends that though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That's the kind of trust that Paul is talking about when he says that Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. And that's the faith that we are to have too. And if we do, that, the message of Romans, right, is that that faith will be reckoned to us as righteousness. Though what we hope for may at times have little chance of succeeding, hoping against hope, as enigmatic as that may be, is exactly what we are encouraged to do as Christians. For Christians, hope for us Christians, hope stands not alone. It does so anchored by our faith and perfected by grace. They work together. Stephen Beale once wrote, as Christians we hold to a supernatural hope against sometimes the hopes of the world. We hope even when it seems like all hope is lost. And this seems indispensable today in a world that seems so hopeless. Whether it's our hope for someone fighting an addiction or battling a grim cancer diagnosis or struggling with some other chronic suffering, really, for all of us, the only hope we truly have is the hope that God gives us. And for me, that's the key. That's the key for this whole thing. 
We've talked a lot about and thought deeply about our response to God. We are constantly thinking about our response to God. And that's good. We should. But the story, if we read it from the other point of view, also describes divine faithfulness to the promises made to us. Through Abraham's response, God, God will never be the same again. Through Abraham's trust, God will never be the same again. By God's word to Abraham, God has created a new family. Indeed, a new world, both for Abraham and God, which gives to each a revised job description, though the goal of a reclaimed creation remains the same. That having made promises and being faithful to those promises means that God is now committed to a future with the one who has faithfully responded. Takes two to tango. There's another bumper sticker. And as true as that was for Abraham, so it is for his descendants. God is committed to you. And so may that same God, the God of hope, fill us all with joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.